just I thought this would be a good place, a good bit to start with this uh, charity slot that everybody liked. So we turned right up Greek Street, didn't we? And uh, the Gay Hazar at number two, which opened in 1953, and it was a restaurant that became known as the haunt of left-wing politicians, such as Tony Benn, Roy Hattersley, Michael Foote, Tom Dryberg, who apparently was a bit of a cottager. I'm adding that. He's a left-wing politician. He was a bit of a cottager. He's supposed to have some kind of... No, no, because I came across him before because he was um, supposed to have some, some kind of run-in with Alistair Crowley or something, but uh, I can't remember all the details. As well as Eisenhower and the Queen of Siam used to go there. Uh, its golden age was the late 60s when Dryberg, a suspected Soviet spy, tried to persuade Mick Jagger and his girlfriend Marianne, Marianne Marsbar Faithful to help target young people for labour. But um, Mick Jagger was having none of it and uh, the encounter came to nothing. Jagger's always been about the money anyway, <laughs> hasn't he? He's always been about the money. Jagger. He's never really been a hippie, old Jagger. I didn't think so. It's funny. I thought I thought you were going to. I thought you said um, left wingers have always been about money because today I I saw this I saw this um this article about Jeremy Corbyn's family home that he always referred to as a old farmhouse. Well, it was Ivy Manor, I think it was called. This mansion that belonged to or something or others part of his estate so anyway left wingers are always pull the ladder up after themselves uh they do say that yeah like these revolutions get so far and then as soon as the uh, middle class have got their toilet roll and bread it's like oh no that's enough now but but also Right-wing people do do claim that as well that they're ultimately they're the left are the most materialistic, you know. With they're trying to, I mean, I'm an atheist myself, but you know, if they're trying to like get rid of God and all this sort of business, and uh, just focusing on the purely material, whereas the right tend to have a strong sort of religious, you know, kind of bent. Uh, yeah. Here we are. Simon's coming. Anything to add to what I said uh, just then? What me? Yeah, or Richard? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's um, uh, I mean, I used to think of myself as a left winger. Not that I, I mean, I had friends who were not, but I hate, I just hate the left of the passion so much. There's been so many of them around me in the last few years, and they all hate each other. I find that the most funny thing: the anarchists, the different communist groups, the uh, momentum labour, the Blairite. Um, Progress the labour lot. They all hate each other. <laughs> I mean, they hate each other, and they all always try and they're always lecturing me, and I just want I just yeah. want nothing to do with them. I'm Simon, to recruit you. Hello. Yep. Can hear. Hello, we can... Hi. Can you see us all? Yes, I can. Anyway, so the gang's all here. We were just talking about um, the gay hussar. We've done that. And now we're going to... Uh, Does the gonna... historic happen there any deals done, or you don't know? I was just telling you about how Tom Dryberg, tried to, who was a suspected Soviet spy, tried to persuade Mick Jagger... Well, that, that failed. So yeah, that failed, so yeah. Any successful ones? He doesn't say. So next door was the, the house of St. Barnabas, which... On the side of was everybody's favourite thing, the uh, penny slot, the penny, the penny slot. tube. Yeah, so let's. Yeah, okay, I love that. Yeah, so we're in Soho Square now. We've gone up to Soho Square, and uh, piss, piss down there, and they must have done. <laughs> I want, I want to know. I want to know what's on the other side. I want to go to go inside and see where the money comes out. Well, you, how are you going to do that? Knock on the door. 
to have come to inspect your tubes. <laughs> well, you're going to need to have some kind of uh, card to flash, you know. Yeah, tube inspector. <laughs> so the House of St. Barnabas is for women that have got, you know, astray. They're poor. Yeah. And it still does that to this day. Three of its rooms can be hired for events, blah, blah, blah. Um, then he talks about the skirts. And then... Uh, okay. So then we're in... So oh, yes. Now, we go around to Soho Square, and uh, we f look out for the unique penny chute attached to railings alongside the house of St. Barnabas that has been used to receive charitable donations for over 100 years. So, so this was um, what unmarried mothers, for example. My grandmother was born in a unmarried mother's house in Chelsea, which is still there. The, the administrative building is still there opposite the town hall with some sort of blah bomb, but it's, it's, it's all very quite slightly innuendo what it, it, it's for. Well, I think quite a few of these things years ago, sort of turn of the century and earlier. Well, this is what we found out on the A, a to your point about Chelsea. There's a Chelsea walk, so that might come up. Oh, B, okay. yeah, B, back in the day, they didn't have charity. There was a thing called philanthropy, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, you had philanthropists. I'd like to know what the biggest donation that's ever been shoved down that tube. <laughs> you sound very authoritative. Is that what you're going to say to them when they let you in on, on your checklist? You need a clipboard. You will need a clipboard and, a, and a something to f a hang around your neck to flash. You know. Yeah. I'd like, to like to throw, I'd like to roll like a, a few like gold ingots down there. Well, you need to get a couple first, don't you? Yeah. So that's your first mission is to uh, get that. So Soho Square. Why did everybody love this one? This particular um... Simon, for instance, this is your favourite of the whole tour. Why? <laughs> uh, well. But it's you know it's up there. I I think it's because one of the rip the main reasons is that I I had absolutely no knowledge of that. It's completely new to me, and it's just a it's just a funny little thing that uh, yeah I, I had no idea it was there. So it's like hmm. I found it quite fascinating. Yeah, when you've been running around London for as long as we have. Yeah, it's like something new that you've never seen. Hmm. Richard, you had no idea of it either did you and you've been here you've been in London the longest yeah I've been to that corner a lot of times and things have happened on that corner and I never knew that thing existed there <laughs> what do you mean things have happened what are you talking about <laughs> uh, like on that corner by that sign I introduced Laurie Love to Vivian Westwood you introduced who Laurie Love who's Laurie Love a person that was accused of hacking the Pentagon, the Federal Reserve, and the White oh. House. Okay. Wow. What's happened to uh, that one? He got off. He got off. Yeah. This is when Richard was hanging around with class war, Daniel. Oh, God. Imagining that. Imagining that somehow hanging around with class or with hawk, class hawk, class war would make him <laughs> would make him rich. Well, if, um, what's her face? The woman, the main woman in class four, married or with with um, Ian Bone's partner. I mean, she owns a nice big house. Yeah, they're yeah, a bunch of fakes. All have really nice houses. They're fake. They're fake as fuck. They asked me to join, funnily enough, and I said, well, I thought, I thought you're an anarchist group. You didn't have to join. Okay, so Soho Square uh, it was laid out in the 1680s, and Charles II. Statue in the middle of the square dates from 1681, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, Sir Ah, oh, here we go, time to change the picture. He's making all the rumbling noises. I think it's Simon. I'm not making any noise at all. Oh, it must be Daniel's fan. But we oh, can't I turn it off. No, not if you're gonna sweat it out, not if you're gonna be in horrible pain. 
Well, it's quite quiet. Shall I to turn it off and see if it makes a difference? Yeah. No, Thank you. Right off. Ah, that's made a huge difference. Oh, has it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, if you get too hot, Daniel, you know what to do, don't you? <laughs> so here we are at McCartney Penis Linda uh, Productions. Nice bit of wood. Is it is, is it? Do you think it's the original wood from back in the day? No, I think it's a little pastiche. Really? When did he build it? That was from the Mackay first came. He came to the square in the 1970s when he was in Wings. Only the band the Beatles could have been. Uh, <laughs> the, the nobody. I keep saying that joke, but nobody. You know that's a pure partridge. It's a shit joke. That's why. It's partridge. It's partridge. Uh, the basement contains an exact an exact replica of EMI Studio Number Two. The legendary venue at EMI's Abbey Road Studios where the Beatles recorded. Um, and also, it, it's, this is the same place where he installed uh, William Burroughs and Anthony Balk to uh, make the cut up movies of, so uh, famed for beatnikism and stuff like that. So. Are they the classic ones? The, with the Brian Geisen? Yes. Right. Yeah. Not yeah, they weren't filmed there, but they were all cut and edited, edited there, and yeah, oh, right. okay. yeah. <clears throat> so there's that, um, and I I love this. You know, the underneath the square are a number of secret underground tunnels and shelters that were last used to protect Londoners during the Blitz, and we were saying that they should bloody uh, open those mm -hmm. up. Yeah, you can make a lot of money, you know. We know what they were originally built for. Yes, I just said to protect Londoners during the Blitz. Oh, so it was ju it was just for the Second World War. Yes, so, according yeah, to this okay. guy. It doesn't say how many. It doesn't say how many there are. No, he just says a number. Interesting. I'd like to know. Yeah. Yes. Well. If this podcast gets popular, maybe we'll be able to arrange with the council to go down there. Yeah. Somehow. I, mean, I wonder where you enter them from. I, I, I mean, I haven't seen... Someone must know. There must be someone who knows. Yeah, someone must know. Someone. You could open the new Blitz Club down there, couldn't you, Richard? Yeah. That would be awesome. <laughs> it would be. And then we went to that time to change the picture. French Protestant Church. The Huguenots. The Huguenots, yes. So that's the French Protestant Church. There was a marriage happening when we went there. It was completed in 1893. Um, the architect was Sir uh, Aston Webb. He's best known for the Victoria and Albert Museum. In the 19th century, London had around 30 French Huguenot churches. The primary one was in Fred Needle Street. However, the church in Fred, uh, sorry, however, the French congregation was already dwindling by 1841, when the church in Fred Needle Street was demolished to make way for the Royal Exchange. Only three Huguenot churches remained. Um, blah blah blah. The Huguenot. The Huguenot influence on Soho after decades of assimilation has largely disappeared. However, this church is a rare legacy and services are still conducted in French. So there you go. And then we moved on to... Um, just wait a minute. Sorry. What, what, the Huguenots, who were they? Weavers? The <coughs> praying weavers or something? Yeah, who were the Huguenots? Anybody know? They were French, yeah, they were French, like, uh, uh, weavers, I think. But religious as well. Oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> but they were very religious as well. I think we come to why they got, why they were being persecuted in France and had to come, come here a little bit later. 
So let's hold on for that. And then we went to Mary Seacole, who was the rival, the, the black lady that was a rival from uh, Jamaica, that was a, the nurse, that was apparently the rival of, um, of uh, Florence Nightingale. And this is the first bit in this tour where you th suddenly you feel a bit askance at the writer, you know, because wh why would you call her, you know, rivals? You're trying to start something, aren't you? You're trying to start trouble. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly what they're doing. He's doing. I can't remember. Somebody said it might have been um, Simon that they they would not have even known each other or rubbed shoulders with each other. Yeah, but he's inventing this like false narrative whether they were like like yeah they were after each other's prizes. Yeah, it's horrible actually. It just it's just a vision, and I don't I don't think he'd even say that if she wasn't black. It was, it was this, you know, trying to cause this bloody division. He says it's a pity her work has not been more widely recognised, and yet she's in the book. She's got a blue plaque. I mean, okay, she's yeah. not on, a, you know, she's not on a bloody pound note or whatnot. But I don't know. I've heard of Mary Seacole. I didn't know, didn't quite know what she. Something do I think I sort of vaguely some sort of nursing or something in the Victorian times. It was it was no more than that. Something very vague. But I've definitely heard of her name, and her name is really well known. I had as well, to be honest. I had heard something on Women's Hour once when I listened to that. Um, but anyway, she she lived to a ripe old age, uh, I guess, for the times, eighteen oh five to eighteen eighty one. So that's not bad. That's not a bad in innings. Uh, then we went to St. Patrick's Church. I don't know if I've got any... Let's have a look if I've got photos of that. And we went inside there, didn't we? I haven't been inside a church in fucking years, you know. Uh, I think Daniel and Bonnie insisted. Let me go in. Any comments about it, Daniel? A very sweet um, statue of Christ looking, uh, you know, like Kenneth Williams. It's just very, very limp. <laughs> well, that's because he's just been fucking take, well, well, dragged down from the cross or something, isn't it? Or you'd look a bit limp if you've been hanging on a cross for fucking. Very effete. <laughs> you'd look very effete if you'd been hanging on a cross for um, forever. But they had different forms of crucifixes back in the day. Some of them were like X shaped, weren't they? Some of them were X shaped and. Um, this, this, um, this little statue was very um, somebody's idea well, not my idea of erotic but you can see it's, it's like this beautiful young man very uh... I quite liked the quietness inside the church I, I, I haven't there's a special kind of quietness isn't there inside of these churches you know apart from in the basement where the children scream. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, I agree with you. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a, you know, sort of atheist agnostic. I'm, I don't think of, don't, I just don't think of God or anything. I'm like, cause I'm, I just don't, you know, I don't believe it, but you know, it's. Um... No, but I love, I love the, uh, yeah, I love the, uh, I love going into churches. I don't think it doesn't matter whether you're religious or not. It's just like a, uh, you know, if you go into one of those spaces just because it's been set aside for, you know, higher thinking, I think it doesn't matter whether you're religious or not. Just it's good to go in there. I agree. I agree. And I, I, I went into the church near where my mother lives um, in the sticks. Beautiful yeah. ancient thing, and I, it was a wonderful feeling of peace. Um, yeah. Have you, read, you know that poem by uh, Philip Larkin, Church Going. No, but I need to look it up. I like, I quite like Larkin, but I don't know much about him. Oh, that, that's a really good one because it's, it's, it's exactly his his take on it. He like he's not he's not religious at all. He goes there anyway just to sort of soak in the ambience. It's very true. It, it's um, particularly living in London, and you know, pretty, I find it a very stressful city. It's getting increasingly stressful as I get older. Um, last time I went into a church <clears throat> was on a a Sunday morning at about 10 o'clock 
I was trying to find somewhere quiet to sort of come down off of this ketamine. But it, mm-hmm. <laughs> it was full of, it was full of uh, religious types doing their Sunday morning service, and I can I could only bear it for about ten minutes. You're probably, you're probably in a similar kind of frame of mind as they were. You know, it's it's a similar sort of thing. Cover your legs. Could you feel them? I had to run out. I could. I couldn't deal with, deal with it. They looked so pleased to see me, and I felt so bad when I, when I just was had to run because I was like, no, not today, not today, I Jesus. What, I think that's. What, I think. I think they're like really religious people. Like they, they 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 get a kick out of it. It is like a drug for them going to church. Oh sure, sure. Yeah, I, I yeah I believe that. I believe that, especially the ones where they swing all the incense around, you know. Yeah. yeah. I remember that thing that we went to, uh, you and I, Simon, at the IMT gallery where they were doing incense. And when, when you were in the room, you were high as a, you kind of were high off the incense. But as soon as you walked no, out of the room into the fresh air, it kind of the, went. Was that the thing with the boiled eggs? Were they boiling eggs? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember that, yeah. Okay, so anyway, that was that. We've done that. Oh, no, this is interesting, though, wasn't it? The, cho- the church stands on the site of Carlisle House, where in the 1760s, the flamboyant Venetian opera singer and courtesan, Teresa Connollys hosted extravagant masked balls and other entertainments that became the, like, you know, eyes wide shut, that became the highlights of London's social calendar. Her occasional lover, Casanova, also visited her during his brief stay in London and um, somebody was saying that Donald Sutherland of all people had played Casanova yeah I haven't seen that but it'd be interesting to see that I'm still here so talk about I'm just trying to make some more light so talk amongst yourselves for a moment have anyone anyone seen that film with Donald Sutherland as Casanova yeah Fellini film I think it's a Fellini film. Oh, right. No, yeah, I haven't seen it. The Nina wrote the music. Who wrote the Nina music? Wrote Nino Who Rota. Wrote... Nino Rota. Nino Rota. I think there's a there's a black and white Casanova film I had that I saw like ages ago. But I haven't seen the Donald Sutherland one. Um, definitely pass me by both of them. I've seen. Yeah, have you seen Don't Look Now with Donald Sutherland? Yeah, yeah, I like. I like that. Yeah. It's great. yeah, it's great. Watched it not too long ago, actually. It's by the same guy that did uh, performance. Have you seen performance? Yeah. He also did that film uh, Walkabout. Have you seen that Walkabout? Um, Jenny, Jenny, Jordan, Jenny Agassi, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he, did, he also did the, the Man Who Fell to Earth as well. Nick Rogue? Yeah. He, he made a Casanova film? No, we're talking about Donald, Donald Sutherland is in Don't Look Now, which is also by Nick Rogue. Yeah. Uh, uh, you're about the past. Twice as loud as everyone else. That's better yeah. for you, Richie. Yeah. Okay. Is that better for everybody else? Can you all hear me? I can hear you fine. Sit down fine. Okay. So, um, but what, apart from being a big, you know, swordsman of the, you know, downstairs variety, what, what exciting happened in Casanova's life? What, what did he do? What, what happened in the film? Don't know. I I, like, I can't remember. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, the music carried the film. All right. Okay. Well, let's we move on then. Um, <clears throat> Next, we found ourselves at number eighteen Greek Street, which was the. Uh, can anybody remember? <laughs> oh, well, the establishment. Uh, um, Karl Marx. Richard got it right. The establishment. Well done, Richard. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Very well done, very well done. 
Okay, so this was the establishment club. It was at the centre of the satirical comedy movement that became influential in the early 60s, ironically titled. The club was always controversial given its founder Peter Cook's desire to create something, and he quotes, where we could be more outrageous than we could be on stage, Dudley, you fucking cunt. <laughs> I added that. Uh, <clears throat> because of Derek and Clive, obviously. Uh, <laughs> in ninth. <laughs> In... <laughs> Ricky, that... Ricky liked that one. In 1963, the Home Secretary banned American comedian Lenny Bruce from performing at the club because he used the F word. You know, he was uh, one of the first, you know, um, you know I'm going to F and blind and and say the n-word and everything you know he didn't care he didn't care so he was he was banned from coming into britain the same fuck he was banned from performing at the club okay and i mean he was banned all over america as well he was he had a terrible he, he had a, not i don't know say stratospheric rise to the top but he became very big and then as soon as he was big he got smashed you know, for using the F word and the N word and stuff like this, you know, I mean, he was, you know, he was a left winger of the time, you know, but um, one of the old school left wingers, you know what I mean? So, but uh, so, so there's absolutely no group was um, free from his uh, acerbic wit. Yes, of course. Which, yeah. which is good, isn't it? Yeah, of course. When, it, when, there's a, when there's a hierarchy and you can target that group but you can't on i'd just rather it all equally across the board i think oh, well, joan rivers was a big fan wasn't she oh, she, yeah she must have been i mean now they try to say in comedy oh no punching down no punching down but this is ridiculous comedy should punch everywhere and anywhere because to you he might if he you know if he's punching down a, a say a um i don't know a a, a bank robber to you that might be punching down depending on your position but there might be somebody even poorer than that bank robber who's thinking well i never robbed a bank so in fact that's punching up you know what i mean so it's always kind of like you can't oh you can't punch down you know and all of this it's bollocks yeah yeah i go, go along with that um but anyway despite lenny bruce not doing very well the club did host performers such as barry humphreys <laughs> A.K.A. Dame Edna Everidge, who my dad despised. Oh, he's a genius. I tried genius. telling that to my dad. He, he hated her more than he hated Kenny Everett. And that's saying something, you know. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a record. I've got a record and it's uh, recorded live at the establishment. It's uh, Frankie Howard. You were saying? Yeah, because it's that. like Peter Cook like rediscovered. Frankie Howard was kind of like it kind oh, of fallen, it's fallen out of favour, really, in the in the entertainment world. But Peter Cook put him back on at the establishment, and he he had like a new lease of life as like a sort of cult figure. Is this a vinyl record? Yeah. Does he say "titty ye not"? It, it, it's it's kind of got he's still got some of that left in his act, but it's more it's more sort of he's trying to be a bit more current. My dad did like Up Pompeii. That was... Yeah, that's that's great. I love it. It was saucy, wasn't it? Well, he was like he was an early advocate of LSD therapy. Do you know that, Frankie Thank Howard? You. Really? Yeah, he was like he was like he was suffered from really bad depression. He was one of the first people in England to be treated with LSD. When well, he said it worked. Yeah, he said it was really good. Cary Grant as well. He was like a real advocate for it. Yeah, I'd heard of Cary Grant. Yeah, I'd heard, but, but Frankie, I'd... yeah, Frankie Howard as well. Wow, oh, fascinating, excellent. Um, so um, ah, and in this same building, on the uh, in 1963, upstairs, Christine Keeler did the famous uh, naked on a naked backwards on a chair. Oh, yeah. yeah. Apparently she didn't want to do it, but they, they pushed her to do it as a kind of um, 
because there was a film being made. Uh, producer of the film. She was a dancer. She was naked backwards. The chair was covering her tit. That's oh. just Richard doing his uh, thing. <laughs> he likes to play the old man with the ear horn. You know. Um, yeah, so that was photographed up there. She didn't want to do it, but having done it, it did make her, you know, very, very famous. Then we went to number 47 Greek Street, where the world famous 18th century romancer, it calls him here, <laughs> Casanova. Um, he only lived from, um, take, what's 25? What's 98 minus 25? That's, uh, come on, guys. That's seven, that's 70, 73. That's not too bad, is it? 73 for a syphilitic kind of monster. Yeah. <laughs> um, he lived at 47 Greek Street for several months in, in 1764. Usually associated with Venice rather than Soho, Cas Casanova nevertheless immersed himself in London society. He, Casanova had previously fathered an, an illegitimate child by who, the lady we heard of earlier, Teresa Comelli, Cornelis. And he arrived in Soho after escorting another of Cornelli's children to London. So that must have happened outside of London. And I wouldn't have... Anyway, whatever. Uh, and then Casanova left England following several brushes with the law, I wonder what the, uh, having run up debts, and he contracted venereal de disease. Typical frog. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't he Italian? Wow, well, same difference. All fucking from over there. Brexit! No, sorry. <laughs> joking. <laughs> joking. Is this a pro Brexit group then? Podcast? We are apolitical. Any, you know, we are free thinkers. <laughs> anybody can come in. Any, any, well, not anybody, but you know. Uh, you know what we forgot to do at the beginning? We haven't done our chosen pronouns at the beginning. We're supposed to declare them, introduce ourselves and our... I prefer concrete nouns. Concrete nouns crush <laughs> pronouns. Dog, <laughs> cat, tree, bear. <laughs> then we went to... Uh, Greek Street was also home to the literary critic Thomas de Quincey. He didn't live very long. Well, I don't know. Actually, no, 1785 to 1859. That's not too bad for back, for back then. Whose book, Confessions of an English Opium Eater. Has, has anybody here taken pure opium? I have. It was amazing. I have. Yeah, I've had some. It was so fucking trippy. It was wonderful. I'd like to try some, but I've never had pure no, I was just very. I found it very, just very, like very mellow. It's like smoking a real, like a hash or something. I was in a club and it just made the lasers just wonderful. I mean, maybe it just relaxed me enough to sort of see things a little bit in that Blakeian way. You know, if the doors of perception are cleansed, you know. Um, uh, he was the first to properly deal with the subject of drug addiction. In it, he describes arriving in Soho as a poor teenager and squatting at number 38, where he was shocked. He was a squatter, where he was shocked to discover a 10-year-old girl living alone. He later befriended a young prostitute named Anne, who saved his life when he fell ser seriously ill. Um, one day in Soho's Golden Square, which we get to later, he said goodbye to Anne before leaving on a short trip out of London returning to find that she had disappeared. Despite his desperate searches, he never found her again. It's Casanova. No, that's Thomas de Quincey, who also wrote wow. Suspiria de Profundis, which um, Dario Argento's classic horror movie, Suspiria, is very, very, very loosely based on. Last film that Joan Bennett made. Suspiria? Mm. And what did she play in it? She played the headmistress, the almost witchy looking character. Okay, and what else would I know Joan Bennett from? Um, she was Constant Bennett's sister. She was in a load of Hollywood films. She's in um, um, 
Oh, that thing with Elizabeth Taylor and Spencer Tracy. Um, about the, the family and Elizabeth Taylor's a bride. Lo loads of big Hollywood films. Oh, she did all those um, Secret Behind the Door. She was in that with Michael Redgrave. It's quite not bad, actually. Um, I forget the name of the director, really famous director. She she did a whole load of films with him in the 40s. Um, of uh, supernaturally weird -y things. So she, she, did, on the door good. she did a lot of sort of uh, horror -y stuff. Not really. I mean, she was a, a mainstream, big Hollywood film star, sort of 30s, 40s. In fact, I think her first Hollywood films were in the late 20s. I think she even got in the end of the silent period. But she was, she was really big. I mean, she was one of the really big names that lasted a long time. Okay, cool. Um, I, now we go to the coach and horses, but I need to um, make some more light suddenly. So... Um... Talk about yourselves, coach and horses. Not what it used to be, he says here, in the book. In the book. Has he ever been? Do you know if I if I close this momentarily and return, will it be this? Will it be when I just come back as it is? You should do. Yes. Okay, I'm just going to try it now. We did a coach and horses that was a gay pub for a while in the late eighties. Richard. None that I know of, no. So which was the one, which was the pub that was just off Old Compton Street at the Cambridge uh, the, uh, the one with Anthony Dennis there. Nielsen. Um, a load of rent boys. Golden Lion, the Golden, the golden, golden Lion, Golden Lion. The Golden Lion. I don't think it was Golden Lion. Um, maybe it was. It was, it, was, it was really funny. I'm back. Yeah, the Golden Lion. Do you remember that? You're, you're, yeah, yeah. You're not that much younger than me, are you? I think yeah, the Golden you're Lion is. Say, but you're, you're actually not that young. <laughs> golden I am, Lion. You know? I am nearly fifty. The Golden Lion is slightly before my time, I think. Yeah, was, I, I only got the tail end of it. I do remember it. But is that where Dennis Nielsen used to go? Is it Richie? That's a bit of horrible. Yeah. That's a bit of horrible history, isn't it? Doesn't make yeah, it true. Clearly, clearly on the tour, and find out some more details about it. this. Is a rent boy pub? Was a rent boy pub, wasn't it? But I'm, you know, this is a supposed to be a semi-family friendly tour. <laughs> I don't know. If we're doing the horror tour of, uh, you know, um, Dennis Nielsen, what a monster. He's still alive, isn't he? No, he's dead now. Is he? Yeah. Oh. Well, good riddance, to be honest. Um, I would have been one of his, you know, types. You know, but you wouldn't have been... To keep him company. Going back to him. I don't I don't want to keep him company. <laughs> you can fuck off. <laughs> Who's keeping me company? You guys are tonight. So well Well he killed company, didn't he? Yeah, I know. I know what you're getting out of it, so I know the jokes. Um So Coach and Horses, it's one of those pubs, it's full of um you know, it became very, you know, it's, its whole thing is based off the 1950s, isn't it? With bacon, etc., all falling in and out of their, pissed out of their faces, you know. Coach and uh, Horses, the pub that has around the edge of the bar, the bit you can piss in, like a little trough built into the floor. Like, it, it, it's a tiled floor, but there's a little um, a screen bit, you know, so you can just piss at the bar. Oh. It's either the coach and horses or the French house, and I'm pretty certain it's the coach and horses. It's either one of those two. It's not the French house, I don't think. I think it must be the coach and horses, and in if that ca in that case, he's uh, he's missed that out of the book as well. It's like a little, you know, like a little um, trough channel, trough. Like, but channel, it's like all the way around. There's like a, well, a tile at, bit with a. What, at what height is it? Is it? On the floor, or is it halfway up? You know, floor. no, it's on the floor. It's on the floor, so you can just stand there and piss. 
I mean, that's what it was. Like. That's what it. I mean, that's what it. And it was obviously. I want to. I need. I now. need to see this. I need to see this. But I uh, look, I've never needed. I every, every time I've been in a pub or a club, I have never needed a trough to allow me to just stand there and fucking piss. <laughs> I'll just do it wherever I fucking want. But yeah, that, I mean, that's. That, I mean, it's kind of what where it would catch your piss if you did do that because it is on the floor. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll fact check that when we finished, and then if it's true, then I'll get the bit of text and I'll post it up at this point where we're talking you know i'm pretty certain it has it's 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 um obviously the interior of the pub is original from when it was built so there were gangsters that went in there the craze billy hill and jack the spot various jewish maltese and albanian mafiosi they controlled the clip joints pornography shops and brothels that made Soho the centre of London's sex industry. Corrupt local policemen largely turned a blind, uh, blind eye to what went on, encouraging a high degree of tolerance that inadvertently benefited London's homosexual <coughs> community and turned Soho into an enclave of unorthodoxy within austere post-war Britain. Um, the most extreme elements of Soho have been cleaned up since the 1970s, haven't they, Richard? Hmm. Yeah. There was a clean up Soho thing going on back in the 80s and 90s, I remember. Well, Richard arrived there in, uh, not to dox him, you know, that means give out your address, but, you know, you've been in Soho, Richard, since 1981. 81, yeah. And your rent hasn't gone up, has it? Yeah, it has. Really? Yeah. No. And the, the, the landlord has to go to the council to ask permission to put it up. Um, Coach and Horses was the favourite place of Geoffrey Barnard, a, a journalist, columnist. Vodka was his favourite tipple. Uh, he used to get so drunk that it often resulted in the Spectator magazine having to cancel his low-life column with the excuse that Geoffrey Bernard is unwell. And there was later a play. Uh, There's a really good documentary on um, you can get on YouTube about Geoffrey Bernard. It's worth watching. He goes around all these places. Okay, I may have watched it because I did go through a period of being... A, you know, reading up on all that sort of 50s Soho thing. Yeah, it's worth watching because there's a bit where he goes in one of the pubs and Tom Baker's in there. He starts chatting with Tom Baker. Well, apparently Tom Baker was a, a regular in all these haunts. Well, yeah, because he used to work. They used to do like, you know, like voiceovers for adverts and stuff. They do it all in Soho. It was like, yeah, he'd, he'd go and do some recording for like doing voiceovers for adverts and then he'd go and uh, go to the colony rooms. Was he a Huguenot? No, John Pertwee was though. John Pertwee was oh. a Huguenot. He was a Huguenot. Who's your favourite doctor? Mine? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Tom Baker probably. Nah, it's got to be Hartnell. The first. He hardly did any. He didn't do many. Yeah, well that's what makes him so classic. You know? I couldn't watch those ones when I was a kid though because it was all black and white. I found it boring. Mm, wow. Boring? I'm... I was terrified. What, the black and white ones? Yeah, with William Hartnell. Yeah, it's a bit too early for me. I remember my first one that I really kind of connected with was Tom Baker. Troughton doesn't get enough love. Yeah, well, that, and then again, you know, I didn't really see any of full episodes of, of him. Mm. There's all shit now, though. As soon as they got that Peter Davidson from All Creatures Great and Small, it was like, hi, I'm out. Oh, that was the, yeah. And then the guy <laughs> after him was even worse. The guy after him was even worse, I think. Yeah, it's just, yeah. But mind you, one of the young ones, the recent ones, he lives around here, near me. We used to see him in Jimmy's. Yeah. Good looking guy. Quite, you know, strapping lad. Anyway, then he goes on about Maison Berto. I don't really care about Maison Berto. 
and then we went down Romilly Street to Kettner's Restaurant, which which was a haunt of Oscar Wilde and his lover, uh, Bosey, Lord Alfred Douglas. And I used to have my, my club down there when I first started it in Romilly Street, number 23. What was your club called? Uh, the Functional Dandy I used to do it with some guy back then. Um, did it alone. How long did it run for? About a year? Three years. Three years? Mm. That's a good run. Yeah, not bad. Also in Ke also also in Kettner's, uh, according to our friend, ah, oh, I don't know. anyway, according to him, Princess Diana was regularly found uh, naked on a bloody piano up there. Oh, yeah, in Kettner's, pleasure seeking. Um, then we went up to the Vauxhall Tavern. Pardon me. She's got the Vauxhall Tavern with. Um... Kenny Everett and um, Freddie Mercury and um, who was the what? Who was um, the Greek woman? Very, very glamorous woman who was on the Kenny Everett show. Uh -huh. Cleo Rocos. Cleo Rocos. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I met her. I met her in um, in a uh, Wait Rose in uh, in uh, Canary Wharf. Oh well, I I met her as well at the Vauxhall Tavern. She was really charming. Was she nice to you? Well, she was promoting this vodka. She was like hawking this vodka. No, oh, okay. Did you get a kiss off no, of her, Simon? Uh, no. No. She was just, yeah, she, yeah, she was just trying to plug this vodka, really. She was the only reason my dad allowed Kenny Everett on in the house, to be honest with you. <laughs> then we went up to old uh, Compton Street. Named, ironically, after the Bishop of London, Henry Compton. You know, to see what Sodom and Gomorrah it turned into. That it was named after a, um, a bishop, the Bishop of London, Henry Compton. But why was it named after him? That's what I want to know. I mean, why? Oh, oh, we'll just name it, you know, out of the blue. Oh, we'll just name it after you. I mean, whose pocket was he filling to get a, you know, a street named after him? You know what I mean? That's interesting, but it's not, not 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 covered in the book. Then he goes on about Wheeler's restaurant, you know, a fish restaurant, bacon and co are all in there. Um, and that's where the Duke of Edinburgh had his odd club for males that became yeah known, yeah came known as the Thursday Club. Ustinov. My dad hated Peter Ustinov as well for some strange reason. Could never really work that one out. Um, mm. David Niven, James Robertson Justice, Larry Adler, inventor of the um, harmonica. Yeah. And guess what? Did the... he invent the harmonica? Yes. He invented it. Richard, come in here. I don't know. Is that what the book says? He had a he had the first hit tune at least with a with a harmonica. And then, oh right, yeah. And then That's the day inventing it, the day that Richard Torrey bought his harmonica was the same day that Larry Adler died. <laughs> it was almost as if that Adler was saying, "Oh no, I just give up now. <laughs> I just completely give up." Don't you remember, Richard? We were going down to Hocum Bay, and you were like, "I remember no." Yeah, and it came on the radio. You were blasting away, dis, dis, uh, what do they call it? Discordantly, on the uh, harmonica, and it came over the radio that Larry Adler had finally packed it in. <laughs> <coughs> Pardon me, sorry. Um, Richard Wagner. That was very boring. Didn't have very much interest to say about that. But then we went up. Wagner. I didn't know Wagner was in Soho. Yeah, didn't you didn't know that? Yeah. Richard Wagner, he stayed at an, an, an he stayed at an unknown address on Old Compton Street with his wife in 1839, recovering from a bad sea journey that he later con claimed had inspired him to compose the opera The Flying Dutchman. Um, he said that he didn't his English wasn't good enough to 
talked to people very well. And he had they had a dog called Robber that ran away, and it caused that that caused the caused him some distress. But the dog later returned, having and he quotes here wandered as far as Oxford Street in search of adventures. <clears throat> Then we went up Fifth Street to Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club, which, you know, doesn't need much to say about it, apart from uh, Tommy was first ever performed there. That was its first ever live performance by The Who, Tommy. And then um, Jimi Hendrix did his last ever last ever show there. But I'm, I'm critical over that entry because, again... Um, it's a jazz club, so why is he only focusing on rock stars that have played there? And also, that was the second venue. The original venue was somewhere else in Soho. It was in Soho, but it was, it was very near. I'm, pre I'm pretty certain that, that is, it's, it, it, it changed venue sometime. I, like I saw Nina Samantha in the 80s, and that was the same venue in the 80s. I think it changed in the 60s or, or even... Cause it starts in the 50s. Well, um, Tommy was performed in 1969 and Hendrix's final performance was in 1970. So while you might, you might be correct, you are probably correct in two of your things of why is he focusing on the rock and that that wasn't the original venue, but this was the venue where those two things happened. Um, and then Richard's disappeared probably for, for a pee or something. But now we get on to, which was one of my, I don't know if we're going to do it justice. Was my, one of my favourite bits was the Bar Italia. You know. Well, John Logie Baird did the, um, he had arrived in Soho after being evicted from his previous premises, having caused an explosion due to his experiments. Baird constructed the first television equipment and his ex new experiments in Soho culminated in October 1925 um, when he ran down a flight of stairs to grab an office boy, William Tainton, let's name him, uh, hauled him upstairs and put him in front of the transmitter and it was the first ever television broadcast. Uh, Baird had to bribe the boy, two shillings and six D, and he became the first televised person in history. The experiment was interrupted by angry local prostitutes who banged on Baird's door to complain that his strange-looking equipment was being used, they thought, to spy on them. Um, and then, because I was thinking... Oh, Simon's gone. That's OK. Uh, I was thinking... That would make a great horror story. But then when we were with Bonnie, she said that, that his experiments in television broadcast uh, came out of his experiments with trying to talk to the undead or uh, spirits on the other side. Do you remember that? Yeah, 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 I remember that. I had no idea. I, met, I, haven't... Sorry. I met some um, psychics many years ago and they were... Um, they're really, I mean, they're really fascinating couple and they were, they were fascinated by, um, analog radio equipment, which would include television and radio. It had to be sort of valve analog equipment because there was all the, um, the, the static noises on shortwave and the weird, not, I mean, it was, a, they, they said that you could, I don't know, go into another dimension or, or anyway, I was, I was really fascinated because I've got this shit here as well. But um, as you know, but um, yeah, I was just really, I'm, so I didn't know about that thing about Baird, but all his stuff was mechanical, I think. His television broadcasting and receiving equipment was all with some sort of weird drum that revolved it was, like a... it was quite it was quite basic i know the the actors had to wear like really stark like black and white makeup because the picture was so bad yeah it was like 30 lines or something yeah, yeah. <laughs> um 
Well, they, they 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 still do that now. Ghost hunters, they like just turn on, and even with the modern equipment, they just turn it on, and then you get all the like with you earlier with the fan going, all that extraneous noise. They claim that they can pull out. Oh no, they just said. No, oh you yes, 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 yes. If you listen carefully, you can just say it, hear it saying "fuck me up the arse, Satan." You know. Kind of stuff. No, but there's what they get like a tape recorder and put it on record and leave it in a house, like an empty house overnight. And then listen back to just like all these like kind of hisses and squeaks and stuff. And they say that they can like they, they can hear like uh, ghostly voices in all that amongst all that kind of hissing. Which um. <laughs> So go on, Daniel. The, the 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 couple I met who were, I mean, they were very believable. They were not um, trying to um, hoodwink me into believing something that I've. I mean, they, I was a complete stranger to them as well, so a little bit reticent to tell me this. But they were talking about um, people's voices or broadcasts or or or. Um, Sort of, I don't know, going around the ether that they could somehow access, but it's all there. You just need to harness it again. I don't know. I'm, I'm not explaining it very well. I'm not one of my most... No, I, I, I think I get it. And Simon and I certainly know what you're talking about, these sorts of things. Maybe they were just f fooling themselves, you know, I mean, or not fooling themselves, you know what I mean? But... I mean, I don't tend to believe in these uh, psychics and that not what you know, cold reading and all of that, where you have these leading questions and all the rest of it, that sort of thing. Well, I had some. I I, I was watching this thing the other day, and people were saying that uh, water holds memories of conversations. And if you, if you have like a sort of dripping tap in your bathroom or shower, it's like on like dripping. You can pick up like uh, like conversations that have been had in that room or like in in the past. Wow. That's verging on a genuinely schizophrenic. <laughs> Although Richard and I have a rule of no uh, flushing the toilet after midnight. Because, Why? Because the gurgling in the pipes does sound like it's saying nasty things. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Do you have that, Daniel, as well? Do you get that? Or you're just completely... No. I get quite a few weird noises here, but touch wood, I've never been freaked out. Um, I mean, there's 72 flats here. I shouted one. I shouted really loudly at a fly once, and it, it just died. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the thing about that is you have to think about all the other times when you've shouted loudly at flies and they didn't die. See what I mean? Well, this is the, I mean, bias. That was, the, that was the one and only time I did it, and it it, it worked. Come on, we all shout at flies all the time. No, I went right up to it, screamed, Aah! Sonic attack. Mozart, don't really care about him. Um, uh, John Snow, his residence, which is at number 53 Thrift Street, but we come back to him for more deets, more interesting deets. Then he talks about Hazlitt's. I didn't really care about Hazlitt's. You know, that was a bit boring. Uh, then we went to the private eye. I suppose it's an iconic... No, that was good. About the, when he died. Oh, ha oh yes. Oh, yes, you're right. Sorry, sorry. Well, Hazlitt's is... Um... Yeah, when he was, he was shoved under the carpet or something. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, ha William Hazlitt, 1778 to 1830. Now, that's not very... That's a mere um, 30 plus... 22 that's a mere 52 years of age he died the landlady, the landlady was going to sell um let the room again yes he lived at number six uh thrift street he was widely regarded as england's greatest literary critic um and it's now where he lived is now the site of hazlitt's one of london's finest hotels um blah 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 uh, Hazlitt died there, and on his deathbed, his last words were, Well, I've had a happy life. <laughs> <laughs> and then the moment his last death rattle went out, his landlady 
rolled him up in a carpet and put him put him behind the furniture in order to show his lodgings to new prospective clients on the very same fucking day. What did he say? He said, well, I've had a happy life. <laughs> Roll him up in the he carpet. Sounded like Mr. Grace from Grace Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody sounded like that back then. They were cultured people. You've all done really well. <laughs> Because <laughs> they're, no, the they're all cultured back then. That's how cultured people spoke. Then there was Private Eye, you know, the iconic blue door, I suppose. Um, they have their pub lunch. They have their pub lunch, pub boozy pub lunches down at the Coach and Horses. And then Trident Studios we went to, um, which is down St Anne's Court, number seventeen. I I always wanted to find out where that was. It was always on my list, so I've now took that off. Which one? The recording I, studio. Because I, I really liked disco years ago, I still do. And a load of, sort of the French disco stuff was recorded there. Tons, all the Alec Cossandino stuff and some of the Munich Machine stuff was recorded there. I mean, a lot of it was. See, he doesn't mention any of that. He's very Mojo magazine, you know, like, oh... You know, you know his common denominator crap, you know, he's going for that sort of shit. Probably lived in East Dulwich and, you know... The boring old bastard. <laughs> big Jeremy Corbyn fan. Just a bit of a dick. So, anyway, it was opened by Barry and John Sheffield. And Now, are they brothers or husband and wife? That's what I want to know. Um... Trident Students, opened by Barry and John Sheffield. It was most famously used by the Beatles to record Hey Jude on the 31st of July 1968. They also recorded a number of songs from the White Album uh, because of its, at the time, you know, uh, top of the range, eight track recording equipment. Uh, I wish we could go back to fucking four track, to be honest with you, myself. Um, uh, That's what I've got. I love it. Well, in the world of the infinite, nothing fucking gets done. No, no, anyway, <laughs> just sprinkle some fucking fairy dust on it, eh, Richie? Isn't it? That's what they say, the trogs. What's it got to do with Hey Jude? Because I'm saying I wish we could go back to a four track. Oh. Whereas in this age... Was of... worst, I was just thinking of that film yesterday it's the worst film i've one of the worst films i've ever seen where they Which say one? where they edgery was it edgery no come on. they they decide to change the name to hey jude instead of hey jude is it by um danny boyle that film no wonder oh is the guy not it's allowing guy. him to <laughs> oh where the indian guy comes back from the future yeah and he uh, finds out all the songs uh, and it, if they hadn't actually ever happened. Yeah, parallel timeline without the any yeah. Beatles. So he gets right, yeah. to, has to change the name to Hey Jude. So yeah. Hey Jude. I haven't. Bloody, awful, well, I haven't watched it. I have. I wonder I don't Johnny it. Rotten is suing one. to not allow him to make a film of Sex Pistols. <laughs> Who's suing? Who's suing? They're they're going to court, aren't they? Johnny, the the Steve Jones and the other. Johnny Rotten? Against Johnny Rotten, yeah. Who doesn't want Danny Ball to make the doc Oh, about the sex pistols. Johnny Rotten is on the is Steve Jones's side? No. Oh, you want them again? Oh. It looks really bad. I've seen the I've seen the pictures. It looks really terrible. Who do you think they'll get to play Sid, uh, Sydney? Dot cotton. <laughs> uh, Ziggy Stardust was done there by Bowie. Hunky Dory. The Boomtown Rats with their mm. classic I Don't Like Mondays. Elton John, he did Your Song. Lou Reed did Transformer there, which was produced by Bowie, as you all know. Uh, Genesis did a trick of the tail. And Queen did Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, they later sold the studio. Current owners respect the bill, blah, blah, blah. You can visit. 
Um, then we get into a load of Karl Marx stuff. Um, I, I mean, I don't know if I really want to go through all this Karl Marx stuff. It's not. It's boring. It's, it's boring. boring. A, yeah, boring. he's a wanker. Huh? He's a wanker. <laughs> oh, you know, I mean, I've, I've told a few friends. Just really touch on this quickly. I think this is important. Yeah. yeah. But he had servants, and he gets, and I imagine she was very, very young. Gets her pregnant, and he gets rid of her, and gets another one in. That girl would have gone on the streets. I was chatting to my my friend Nicola about this. You know, a, a young servant girl, pregnant by her in quotes master. She would be she would be the one benefiting from that penny going down the chute. I mean that they really are absolutely despised and, and, and demonized and it would have been miserable for her and the kids. So fuck you, Karl Marx, and fuck you, communism, that's what I bloody say. And all those middle class bourgeois commies I know driving their flashy cars and living in four bedroom houses in gated communities. And not only that, one of the one of the children died, and it had to go into a, a pauper's grave without a fucking uh, box, because he wanted to have the servant. So the, the the child had to be, you know, in a pauper's grave. So that was that was that a child that he that she had that was his? It's one of Marx's children. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, as, and then, as soon as, uh, as soon as uh, Mrs. Marx came in, into, came into her inheritance, they were out of there like a shot up to somewhere nice and posh. Yeah. Um, so that's all about. Like, oh, I said, like I said to you, the the last last boss I had was a communist, but with a lot of money, a lot and a very fancy background, and and relatives living in Knightsbridge. So, I rest my case. Isn't that? Isn't it good if they're rich and communists? I miss what you were saying earlier, maybe. I just I think it's just really hypocritical because they, they bang on about every person I know who, who's been a cop, well, with one exception, actually, but most most people I've, I've rubbed shoulders with who, are, who, who claim to be communists or say they're communists live a very charmed, very comfortable life. And so, it's like putting up the if I become up the communist, do you think that happened to me? Well, you are well, polished. I don't think but... becoming a communist that necessarily leads to getting a load of money. Is all these people have had money from you know their parents had money. They've they've always been really comfortably off. We are going to have to cut this. Let's not. Let's gonna not be gonna, yeah. It's going to have to be cut. <laughs> Why don't you cut, cut it and only put these bits in and discard the rest? No, no, we won't cut it. We'll just bleep it. We'll just bleep <laughs> the name. We'll just bleep the name. We're not going to cut it. We're not going to cut anything. We'll just bleep the name. Just, uh, I've heard the, fr the wonderful phrase professional charity fund grabbers, and I think that sums that type up really well. And they're a breed. They are very, very, very clever. They have they're brilliant businessmen and women, but their their product is, I mean, really lacking. I mean, really shoddy. But they know how to get the money. I've always thought of her as a kind of female Cartman from um, uh, South Park. You know, uh, Barbara Cartman. No, Cartman from um, South Park. You must respect my authority. Anyway, uh, anyway, whatever. So then we go to the colony room, uh, which Simon, colony room was a one of the, another one of these drinking holes of the, you know, the great and the bad, you know, the damned and the magnificent, you know. You were, uh, we were laughing when they wouldn't let me in. So you weren't let in. Simon wasn't let in. No, I got to the top of the stairs. I got to the top of the stairs. I tried to pop barge in, <laughs> and it was yeah. Ian Board, he just said. Uh, you have to be proposed and seconded to come in here. And then like, we uh, couldn't get any, just went, goodbye, children. <laughs> I mean, I was in there, I've been in there about two, three, maybe four times, and it was always rank and horrible. Actually, I think you were with us one time, Richard. It was after, um, after a Sadie Coles thing. 
and uh, what's his name? The actor um, that you wanted to play you in our in our play. Um, Jude, Law. Jude Law was in there with his girlfriend. You know, do you remember that? Yeah, I remember. He was in the corner with his girlfriend, looking really shifty. Um, Is that the night? No bra. Was there? Yeah, I think so. Who you know? So. Um, Jude Lord with Sadie Frost. That's right, yeah. That's right, yeah. Um, uh, that was a good night, actually, but previous, other times when I've been in there, the atmosphere just stank. I mean, it was horrible, uh, just a horrible atmosphere in there of, like, this kind of, like, thing of, like, oh, everybody used to be bitchy in the past, so we'll continue being bitchy, but without any of the sort of gravitas you know what i mean just being bitchy for bitchy's sake it was just horrible yeah i think even if i'd gone in there it would have, it wouldn't have been what i was looking for it's, it was like a kind of it was like you know it was like uh yeah what you said like people trying to keep the old spirit alive but it's, it was kind of dead yeah was it uh, must have been to the sort of tail end of it it's, well i think it was the, it was really i think it, the real kind of heyday was in the sort of 70s i think yeah. by the by the early nineties, it was really kind of it kind of everyone had sort of moved on. I think one of you said Tracy Emin was there. I mean, the fact that Jude Lord's there. Jude yeah, Lord's well, that's what it had. There, it had this is... kind of it had this whole new sort of lease of life because of yeah, all the YBA. YBA. Yeah, so it had this kind of little last gasp of like popularity. But the YBAs had no right to kind of adopt that kind of big. Yeah, no, they just did. It was kind just, of attitude because they're all pampered yeah. pups. Yeah, yeah. It was just because of Francis Bacon, really, because Damien Hirst was, like, obsessed with bacon. And so he just brought all of his mates there. Well, then we go to another pub, the bloody French house. Um, I've got to go because someone's coming round. I didn't who? realise it all so long. Who's coming round? Jay. All right. OK, Richie. Well, thank you for... I'll leave you on. All right. I'll jump in if while I'm well, I'll be in the shower. So. Yeah, but we want All we right. want to. All right, thank you for coming, Richard. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye, Bye. Richard. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> On to the bloody French house. I don't know. Do we want to talk about that? I mean, what's to say really? Um, again, you know, all the drinkers and all the rest of it. You can. Well, only I think get... it's good. you should. It's worth mentioning because it's one of the last of those sort of places that's actually still there yes because we didn't mention that the colony club is no longer the colony yeah club. the colony rooms is gone yeah. you know half of these places are gone that's the that's one of the only ones which is still there yeah it, yes that's that's worth mentioning um you, you can only um, this guy's left out loads of um clubs like murray's and stuff that was in soho for absolutely I mean, years and years and years. It only closed in, well, it closed in the 70s. I know it's a long, very long time ago now. But it was, it was there from uh, about 1919, I think it opened, if not earlier. The br brilliant book, I got it, um, because someone got hold of all the costumes. It was it was all pretty much naked show guys. It's where Christine Keeler and Mandy Rice Davis met. So again, it's all tied in with Christine Keeler again. Yeah. And it was um, really very sort of risque, pretty much naked, pretty much naked hostesses. But Gertrude Lawrence started there. She did cabaret there in about 1919. Um, but again, it changed. It changed venues in Soho. I think in the in the 30s or 40s, it moved to it moved once. But it was really big. The book's fantastic. What's it called? Murray's. No, the name of the book. Oh, it's called Murray's. It's called oh. Murray's Cabaret Club. Okay. Um, about the French house, he says, it's always attracted a diverse clientele ranging from local prostitutes, I don't think so much anymore, but I'll, give, I'll, I'll allow it, to one down and out who used to leave after last orders every night to return to a tree he lived in on Hampstead Heath. Limey. Today, he says, the atmosphere is still interesting. And he, he, here he's showing his talons again. Although, as with many of Soho's iconic venues, the pub is perhaps trading a little on past glories. 
Uh, Simon, that applies to the whole of Soho, really. Well, Nat, this definitely in the last five years. Um, Simon's disappeared. Hopefully, he will come back. Um, then we went to the Admiral Duncan. We don't really need to talk about that. The bomb. Yeah. Ripped out all the beautiful. When it became a gay pub, they, they gutted the amazing interior that was the original. Oh, all, really? All the ship. Yeah. And it was like, um, what's the bottom of a, a ship? The, you know, the, the hull. The hull. So it was like the, the ceiling was the hull. So it had this sort of slightly cathedral look to it. It was, it was very unique inside. And okay. it survived right up until the 90s. And then it was ripped out. So it was no, it was just a straightforward straight pub up until the nineties, and then they fucking yeah, yeah. And when they turned it into you know, the gay pub, they they closed, closed it closed down as the you know I'm sure there are plenty of queens went there as well. Um, they closed it down, re give it gave it a big reaper because you remember Compton's. I mean that's the second load of it. What we have now is the the original interior was ripped out in the late 80s i think in competence guy i remember it just and then they made it all industrial looking in the early 90s and then that wasn't popular and they gutted it again and put this pastiche victorian interior in but none of that that you see in compton's is original it's all you know junk well compton's i can say two things about compton's no i'll only say one um it, it, that's where I saw Richie Manick from the Manic Street Preachers after he had supposedly committed suicide. And I know it was him because I, I saw him across the uh, across the room and I thought, you look just like Richie Manick. And then I looked at his arm and it was scarred up like he'd cut that, you know, four, not with the, the, the four reel. It was scarred up like that. I didn't say anything. I didn't make a big deal out of it. I just was like, oh, okay. I just pretended I didn't know. He knew and I knew, you know, but we didn't say nothing, you know what I mean? But and we, have we got the energy to push on? Roberto's come back, so can yeah. I have another 10 minutes? You want to have a little break? No, no, no. Oh, I'm you've got 10 minutes. 10. I'm going to piss uh, off. I don't know if we can do... Well, we've got the two eyes. Uh, that's where the... You know, on Compton Street, that's the beginning of, um, of uh, you know, it was the first rock and roll bar. Um, then My we... mum went, I mentioned to you. Uh, yeah, your mum went, yes. Then we got the, the church behind Richard. Um, Kemp, Kemp House. Dog. Kemp House, where... Um, the next most interesting thing is Jon Snow again, uh, who was brought up earlier. Uh, the John Snow pub on the corner, uh, the John Snow pub, uh, which is on, um, well, anyway, it uh, doesn't really matter. It's, it's, it, you'll find it, listeners, the John Snow pub. Uh, John, uh, it's named, it's a pub, it's named after the teetotaler, ironically, Dr. John Snow, who made medical history when he proved the connection between infected water supplies and cholera. London suffered a number of devastating cholera outbreaks between 1831 and 1860, and in 1849 alone, 53,000 Londoners died of the disease. During one such outbreak in 1854, Snow realised the victims had one thing in common, their use of a water pump on Broad Street. He persuaded a sceptical medical establishment many of who believed cholera was an airborne disease of his concerns and the handle of the pump was removed almost immediately the ep epidemic abated thus proving his case that's great isn't it that's that, i like that that's really wonderful but it's uh, one of one of us said wasn't me but one of you guys said about oh i never noticed the pump before then you read a bit more that it had only been stuck there recently well it's a replica yes but we didn't we didn't want to mention that then we went. Then we went to. Um, uh, we followed the map to reach Marshall Street. Then we bore right. On the right-hand side was a dismal tower block, and <laughs> and this tower block stands on the site of the birthplace of the poet and visionary artist William Blake. His parents ran a tight shop on Twenty Seven Broad Street, and as a four-year-old, William believed he saw a vision of God's face pressed against his bedroom window and throughout his life he 
I don't know what the right word to say. I'm, I'll say suffered. He suffered from visions throughout his whole life, didn't he? Old Blakey. And, like, uh, like H.P. You didn't know that? Dude, he's always having visions. And, like H.P. Lovecraft, had no success during his actual lifetime. Oh, well, oh very, definitely. very limited success. Very limited. Yeah, yeah. This is William Blake. Pardon me? This is William Blake. Yes, yeah. Blake of um, Tiger, no, Tiger Blakey, Shining Bright. Blakey, no, Blakey from on the, bus, on the buses. Oh, I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Simon, Simon, friends with Olive. Simon busting out a joke there at the end. Coming in at the end with a big joke. Um... <laughs> So that was, yeah, again, the the author being a, you know, dismal tower block. It just proves that he's not done the knowledge in the recent times, you know, because we were there and it's very posh outside, isn't it? Um, then we did Carnaby Street. Now, that was good. Carnaby Street um, was set up by, it started because a guy called, an entrepreneur called John Stephen opened a boutique here in 1958 and you, oh, he's gone to get them. Or he's... Yeah. No, I'm here. I just and, had a lamp on. And you say you have a couple of his suits, original suits by John Stephen. I've got, I've got one suit and I've got a really beautiful brown velvet jacket, a very sort of early mod type of one that's, that's still in very wearable condition with a label in as well. And you won't admit whether or not you still fit in them. <laughs> no, I, I admitted that I can't fit in it. I mean, my... my uh, my my stomach is just you know it's atrocious. So are they worth a bit of money then? They 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 are. Um, possibly, and I've got a lot of Katie Stevens shirts, which are really uh, you can see Westwood pinched her. Uh, the who's, Kate, her who, who's Katie yeah. Stevens? K A T Y. That's how she spelled it. That was his um, ex-wife. So uh, she did. After he died, she sort of continued with it. She did loads of um, tailoring. So load, loads of um, people I knew from the mod scene donkeys years ago was go and get stuff made by her. All right, let's speed. Let's let's let's, let's 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 speed on. Uh, then there was at, this is very interesting. Thank you. Uh, it, it'd be nice if you could take a photo of them and send me that photo. Then I can put it up at this point in the. Um, you don't have to be wearing them, but I can put this up. Put them up at this point in the uh, pod. So anyway, then okay. Antonio uh, Canaloni, the French, uh, sorry, Italian painter. We went past that. Canaletto <laughs> Canaloni. Yeah, lasagna, Antonio lasagna. Uh, then we went to Golden Square, where they think that might have been named after the gelding, the, the gelding, gelding, golden of the, the castration of the horses. Uh, then we went to Our Lady of Assumption, the church, which was interesting in the end. I thought it might be a boring diversion, but it was interesting in the end to hear about how crazy the riots were back then. Because there was a, the anti-Catholic Gordon riots of 1780, the church was broken into, and they fucking ran in and stole all the gold. And then we went to my favourite bit of all, Great Pulteney Street, uh, John William Polidori. He was uh, Byron's drug dealer basically and on the same night that they wrote um or they came up with frankenstein he came up with the vampire which was you know somebody asked me have you read it and i have i said yes i have read it it's not and i did like it but it's not about the quality of the writing or the narrative it's about the idea the switch the change that has created this modern myth that will last throughout time because previously to that as i said vampires were just these hairy uncouth shambling beasts and he turned them into these sort of byronic figures that we have now and that myth there's a modern myth that will you know echo throughout time and um polidori poor old polidori was he got the book he got the story published and then he was mocked in society not only by society but by byron himself who i think he was partly under byron's spell and all of that Bloody killed himself in the same house, 38 Great Pulteney Street, where he was born by drinking fucking prussic acid. And I think it's very sad. He was only 26, and it must have been a horrible, horrible way to go. With no 26. knowledge. 26. With no knowledge of the massive modern myth that he, that he created, you know, that's going to go on forever and ever for as long as there's an earth, you know, and probably even why that. He must have had some idea how hideous 
his death would be by drinking this acid. Surely there was a, I mean, what on earth was going on with him to make him do that? It would have been an agony. Well, I suspect he was kind of in love with Byron. I don't want to say gay love, but certainly under his spell, you know, like, and then to be rejected, cast aside by not only him and society, to have nobody. I don't know what to say. Very, very sad. I, I have cried about it. I did. I shed some tears for the poor guy. Punishing himself. <sighs> By doing that. You know. I mean, it's a bit. I, the next thing is only Marx again, where they had the. Let's not dwell. Um, next thing was the Red Lion pub, where Marx, once again, they were up there trying to work out the Communist manifest, Manifesto, and they had a te bitter 10 day debate about pronouns ensued. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it didn't, but they were talking about who's going to write the Communist Manifesto, and basically Marx and Engels won. Uh, Prussian spies were there, and um, claiming, and people claimed that they were trying to assassinate Queen Queen Victoria, but that that didn't happen. And you know that that's it, really. Thank you very much, guys. Um, it's thanks for doing this again. I really appreciate it. It's, You're welcome. It's harder, you know. We got there. We got there. Well, I've got, I've got a definite new load of knowledge about that particular area. So doing that, that's like, that's like the third time being over all that. <laughs> yes. Well, as I said on the on the walk, you know, after doing it twice, I never want to do it again. But like, well, if... but it's it's up here now forever. Yeah. Do you do Bermondsey next? Uh, Bermondsey Rotherhive, yes, I'm trying to arrange it 